بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وخاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا المصطفى أبو القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد من لم يكن علويا حين تنسبه فما له من قديم الدهر مفتخر والله لما برى خلقا وأتقنه صفاكم واصطفاكم أيها البشر فأنتم الملأ الأعلى وعندكم علم الكتاب وما جاء به السوار آل النبي آل النبي نجوم في الوراء زوار محمد شمس والمرتضى قمر مطهرون نقيا ثيابهم تجري الصلاة تجري الصلاة تجري الصلاة عليهم أينما ذكروا We congratulate all the Islamic nation and especially the master of this time سيدنا ومولانا صاحب العصر والزمان المهدي المنتظر عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف On this blessed occasion of the birth of حجة الله الإمام علي بن موسى الرضا صلوات الله وسلامه عليه His mother took them was a non-Arab lady from Morocco. And she says his pregnancy was very easy. It was very light. And I used to hear him doing tasbih in my womb. And when he was born, he did sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his lips were moving. And then his mother was saying, I need a lady or I need someone to help me nurse him. They said, why is the milk running low? She said, no, there's plenty of milk. But I want to perform salat 
and I want to perform more ibadah. So she was a very noble lady, the Stuktam. And it is said that she was also the mother of Al Ma'suma Fatima alayhi salam. So Al Ma'suma alayhi salam, Fatima, she is the sister of Imam Al Rida from his father and his mother. Imam Al Rida alayhi salam was born on the 11th day of the Qa'dah. He spent about 29 years with his father, Imam Al Kadhim sallallahu wa sallam, and then. His father was martyred when he was at about 29 and something. And then he spent 20 more years after that and was poisoned at the age of about 49 and something, a few months. One of the main highlights of the life of Imam al Rida, if not the main highlight of his life, is Wilayatul Ahd, succession being acknowledged as the successor of the Khalifa of his time, the Abbasi Khalifa of his time, and that was Al-Ma'moon Al-Abbasi. If we take a look quickly at the times of the Khilafa of Bani Al-Abbas, the Khilafa of Bani Al-Abbas, of course, was based and founded with a call to love Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam That's how they founded the Khilafah. But the minute they cut the Khilafah, their policy was to eradicate Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam To kill them. Al-Mansur al-Abbasi, for example, brings the son of Hassan III, which is the grandson of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam His son, he tells him, I'm going to kill you in a way that nobody else has killed you. Or no one else has killed anyone else before. First time. He brings a cylinder. He puts him inside a cylinder. And he pours whatever the equivalent of concrete back then. He pours it on and he kills him right there in that cylinder. And Bani Abbas started persecuting Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam like nothing else. So there was heavy persecution on Ahl al-Bayt. Established by... The first Abbasi Khalifa as Safah, the murderer. Then Abu Ja'far al Mansur who killed Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. Then by Al Mahdi al Hadi al Abbasi. And then Harun who killed Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam. And the tradition was continuing. So this was the policy of Bani al Abbas. Now, all of the sudden, we find Ma'mun al Abbasi coming to power. After killing his brother Muhammad al Amin, he killed his brother and he came to power. All of a sudden, things changed around. We find Al Ma'moon bringing Imam al Rida alayhi salam close and, in fact, making him the successor. At first, he asked him to be the Khalifa, but then he made him the successor. What happened? Is it because Al Ma'moon al Abbasi loves Ahlul Bayt so much? And the answer is no. The politics. Al Ma'mun al Abbasi was a true politician. And politicians only look after what? Some of them, if not the majority of them, their interest. Whatever serves my interest, I will do it. It doesn't matter. Giving false promises, appointing people, unappointing, removing people, killing, doesn't matter. Ma'mun al-Abbasi was a very intelligent man. He was very intelligent. First of all, he killed his brother al-Amin. The supporters of al-Amin were not happy with al-Ma'mun. Al-Amin had supporters. They were not happy with al-Ma'mun. Okay, so that was, that was one problem. Second, because of all the hate, because of all the animosity and all the pain they inflicted upon Bani Hashim, the Bihani Hashim were also not happy with them. And in fact, several revolutions led by Bani Hashim were led against Bani Al Abbas, the example of Fakh, the revolution of Fakh. When 300 of Bani Hashim rose in a revolution led by Al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Al Hassan al Muthalath. So 
That was also something happening. And then the lovers of Ahlul Bayt were also not happy. So I think that the situation, the dynamics of his state was starting to get in a turmoil. Now what does he do? He thought, what would be the best thing that would serve my interest and keep my power? This is all he's after, his power. He thought, first of all, let me test the water. See if Ali ibn Musa Riva wants to become the Khalifa. Let's see if that is, is the case. So first he came to Imam Riva and told him, you become the Khalifa and I will be your advisor. And Imam Riva alayhi salam rejected that offer. al mamun of course had intentions. If Imam Riva said, yes, I'll become the Khalifa, that means what? It means he is what? He has interest in what? In power. And Ma'mun has learned from his father, Harun al-Rashid, he himself said, in an incident one day when Harun really respected Imam al-Kavim alayhi salam, and that incident, in that incident, Ma'mun says, that's when I learned about Tashayyu, I learned about Shia from my father, he says. They said, how? He said, one day Imam al-Kavim came to visit my father, I saw my father giving utmost respect to him. Respect that he has not given to anybody else. He forgot about all the dignitaries, the ministers, and he was chatting with this man, who is Musa ibn Ja'far. We didn't know who he was. Until he left, my father stood up with him, walked him all the way, helped him ride his camel, took his camel out. He said, I've never seen my father do anything like this before. So then I asked him, my father, who is this man? He said, father or son, هذا خليفة الحق وأنا خليفة الدنيا. He is the Khalifa of Haq. He is the rightful Khalifa. But I'm the Khalifa of Dunya. I'm the one in power. So Ma'mun says, I was the bravest of my brothers. So I told my father, I said, Father, if that's what you believe, then why don't you give the Khilafah back to him? He was young still at the time. He didn't really understand. He said, Ajunint, are you crazy? If you, my son, were to, do, to dispute this power with me, I would separate your head from your body. You, my son. So he inherited this. He learned this. And he digested it in his system. So now he wanted to test the water. Does this man want to dispute Khilafah with him? So that he'll finish him. That's what he learned. He saw that, no, he's not interested in Khilafah. Okay, so that now is out of the question. Now, how can I strengthen my power? How can I establish my power? How can I keep everybody happy and quiet? Let everything settle. So then he told Imam al-Rida, I want you to be my successor then. Waliyu al-Ahd. If I die, you become the Khalifa. And here, first of all, if he brings Imam al-Rida, then all the many Hashim, Everyone who supported the original slogan of Bani al-Abbas, the original slogan, and Rida li Ali Muhammad, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> Seeking the pleasure of Ali Muhammad. Those, everyone who supported that slogan will be happy because why? Ali ibn Musa Rida now became the successor. The other thing also, he wanted to show the people he wanted to belittle the status of imam al-rida in the hearts of people how by telling them look this is your imam whom you claim that he is abid zahid he is such a worshiper he's so devout he has no interest in this dunya and the materialistic life look at him he's become my successor he has interest in khilaf he wants to become a leader is this the imam you follow this was his game and in fact imam al-rida one day told him explicitly in one because for months he was running after Imam al-Rada for months trying to persuade him to become the Wali al-Ahad to become a successor and Imam was until one day in the Majlis of Al-Ma'mun Imam al-Rada said Ya Ma'mun you don't want me to become your successor because it's really out of your good heart you want to serve your interest and he so he became upset he said what is my interest he said, you want to tell people, this Ali ibn Musa riba this man, this imam, has interest in khilafah. And that's what you want to spread. 
So Ma'mun became very upset because now his plan is exposed. Imam Ghadda knows. He said, listen, you either accept or I'm going to separate your head from your body. Khalas. That's it. We've given you enough time. I'm going to kill you. He told him, right, explicitly. Khalas. So here, Imam Ghadda, salamullahi alayhi, was left with three options. Okay, now Imam Ghadda has three options. The first option is to reject. Tell him, forget about it. Kill me. And get killed. That is the first option. And that option, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to keep death away from ourselves. Try to refrain from it as much as we can. In this case, if Imam gets killed, he saw that it is not in the best interest of Islam or Muslims if he gets killed. At this particular time, when all people who are followers of Ahlul Bayt could not even say that they are followers of Ahlul Bayt. I mentioned the story once of the grandson of Imam, Sajjad Salamullahi Alayhi. His grandson, his daughter died and he could not tell her. He could not tell her that you are, you are a Sayyid, you know, your father is Sayyid, we are from the children of Rasulullah. And she was old, she was the time of marriage. She was, so she became an old child, an adult. And, and she died he, without knowing that she was the granddaughter of Rasulullah. This was Isa, Isa ibn Zayd, ibn Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam. So to that extent where people could not speak, could not even say a word, Imam said this is not in the best of interest to the Shia, to Islam, to Muslims, to get killed. So then, that was the first option. No. The second option is to accept without any conditions. Like signing a blank check to Ma'mun, saying, for khalas, I will be your wali al ahd No problem. That is the second option. The third option is to accept with conditions. And Imam alayhi salam saw this is the best option. To accept with conditions. This is something that he can serve Islam and get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though he was not really interested in this. He was forced into it. So... He told al Ma'mun, if that is the case, then I accept but with conditions. Now Ma'mun was so excited, any conditions, fine, as long as you accept. And what are these conditions? Imam right there and then said, said bring a paper and a pen, the equivalent of paper and a pen. And let's write this down. And this document is documented by almost all historians. There is a unanimous agreement on this document where Imam al-Ridha on the spot gave this dictation. What did he say? Let's, let's listen and read. I will not translate everything. I will highlight some of the things because this document is amazing. It gives some of the rights of Ahlul Bayt that had been lost for decades, if not centuries. It also highlights how Ahlul Bayt felt about the first incident, the first deprivation of rights. How did they feel about that? Here it's all highlighted. And what is their vision of true Khilafah? What does he say? He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah al-fa'al lima yasha' wa la mu'aqqiba, la mu'aqqiba li hukmih, wa la mubaddila li qadaih. يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنْ وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورِ Interestingly, in Arabic, part of the eloquence, when somebody wants to say a speech or somebody wants to write something, usually the person starts with a line that relates to the speech or to the document. For example, for example, when somebody wants to recite عَقْدُ nikah, nikah, a nikah ceremony, Usually the reciter who recites the nikah, for example, says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah alladhi ahalla nikah Praise be to Allah who made marriage halal, lawful. So why? Because God deals with marriage. And a person might recite an ayah that deals with marriage, for example. When a person is writing his will, or her will, a person might start by quoting an ayah that talks about death, Oh, that deals with will. It relates to it. This is part of the eloquence of the Arabic language. 
here Imam Rida, how does he start a speech or a document about becoming or accepting the successor or succession? How? He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans and there is no change to his plans. No one can change the plans of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows He knows what the eyes, you know, literally this ayah means This is an ayah in the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the sins of the eyes that others cannot perceive, cannot tell. When a person looks at something haram, others may not figure it out. May not know this person is actually committing a haram. But Allah says, I know. And Allah says, وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورِ Allah knows the traitor. If there is a traitor, Allah knows what he is hiding. Allah knows of the hypocrites and what they put inside, what they're hiding. On the outside, they're saying something. But on the inside, Allah knows their plans. This is what the Imam, from the beginning, he's saying this is all... It's not the true intentions of this man. This man is a traitor. Allah knows about the traitor. So he's highlighting it from the beginning. What is he? And it's amazing, subhanAllah, all these conditions, Ma'amun. Ma'amun was not an ordinary man. He was a alim. It is amazing how these conditions went by him. Otherwise, he would have told Imam, Rida, hold on, change that statement. Change this. You know, redefine it or re-say this. Rewrite that. He didn't. Amazing how all these things slipped by, by him. But subhanallah, Allah wanted to keep this document for centuries as a proof of the greatness of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam and the right of Ahlul Bayt in Khilafah. And how Imam al rida felt about this. And what was the plan of Al-Ma'mun behind all this. Allah wanted to keep it as a proof. So right there, he's saying there is a traitor here. There is somebody who is hiding something. He's plotting for something. And then he says, وَصَلَّ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ فِي الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ الطَّيِّبِينَ صَلُّوا عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ Here Imam al rida also brings something that has been forgotten about for decades. He tells people and reminds them how to do salawat. For decades people are saying, اللهم صلي على محمد and they stop. And unfortunately, until today, Imam is saying, No. Interestingly, in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Muslim, I was checking it today, Hadith number 439. The title of the section, the title of the section is Babu Salati Ala Nabi Sallallahu Alayhi Wasallam. This is how he writes it. بعد التشهد You know, how to say salat on the Prophet and he says صلى الله عليه وسلم He stops right there. After tashahud. Interestingly, although he adds بعد التشهد although the hadith doesn't say after tashahud. He's bringing it يعني عجيب. So the quote, he quotes the hadith and I'll summarize it. From Bashir ibn Sa'd. Bashir ibn Sa'd comes to Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah أُمِرْنَا نُصَلِّي عَلَيْكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ فَكَيْفَ نُصَلِّي عَلَيْكَ We have been commanded to say salawat on you. The ayah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا يعني say salawat على محمد وآل محمد صلوا على محمد. Then the Prophet responded saying, say, اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم. وبارك أو ترحم على محمد وآل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم. So interestingly, Muslim in this hadith that he himself is narrating, he is saying that the Prophet is saying we should say اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. But he says himself when he puts the title of the chapter or the section, he says the Salat ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He stops. Yani he himself doesn't apply the hadith that he himself is narrating. Ajib. Why? Because the Shia say it. That's why. Shia say it. Even if it is haq, even if it's truth, we're not going to do it. So Imam al rida alayhi salam is bringing back this documentation. This is he's showing it in a document, in a written official document. 
that we have to say salawat on Ahlul Bayt alayhim was salam. And then he continues, وَأَنَا عَلِيَّ بْنَ مُوسَى بْنِ جَعْفَرْ أَقُولُ وَأَنَا عَلِيَّ بْنَ مُوسَى بْنِ جَعْفَرْ I, Ali ibn Musa ibn Ja'far, say that Amir al-Mu'mineen is referring to this materialistic khilafah. Because we have a khilafah al-zahira and khilafah al-batina. Khilafah al-zahira, this outside khilafah, the texture, the outside, yes, it's in the hands of al-Ma'mun al-Abbasi. But the inside, the hidden, the true meaning of khilafah, it is chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In both cases, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, when He told the angels, when He told the angels, I'm creating, I'm putting a Khalifa, I am putting. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ I am. And then Allah tells Dawood also in another ayah, Ya Dawood, we made you Khalifa. I made you a Khalifa, Ya Dawood. Allah declares who the Khalifa is. Not people. So here, but however, the khilaf al zahiriya the outside is in the hands of Ma'moon. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen arafa min haqqina ma jahilahu ghayrah. He knows or he learned about our rights, what others have ignored, our rights. Yani what? This khilafah is actually our right. If somebody comes to your house, takes your house, you know, occupies it. And then after 10 years, 20 years, he says, you know what? I'm going to give it back to you now. Give it back. Is he doing you a favor? Is this a favor? It's your own house. He took it, and now he's going to give it back. And he's giving the haqq back to the people. It's people. The rightful people. And Imam Rida is saying, he's giving, he knows, he learned. This Ma'moon learned our right, which others have ignored. So this is our right. He's not going to do us a favor. This is our haqq. But again, it slipped by al-ma'moon. This didn't catch his attention. فَوَصَلَ أَرْحَامًا قُطِعَتْ وَآمَنَ أَنفُسًا فُزِعَتْ بَلْ أَحْيَاهَا وَقَدْ تَلَفَتْ He said now he is reconnecting the, and establishing the kin. After killing the Bani al-Abbas, of the killing Bani al-Abbas, you know, Bani al-Abbas killing Bani Hashim, now he's coming back to bridge. You know, bringing back, establishing some kin. And then he continues. Until later on he says, وَإِنَّهُ جَعَلَ إِلَيَّ عَهْدَهُ وَالْإِمْرَةَ الْكُبْرَ إِمْ بَقِيتْ بَعْدَهُ He's giving me the succession if I stay after him. He's putting a condition here, you know, putting a, a شرط, إِنْ شَرْطِيَّ If I stay. Meaning what? Means I'm not going to stay. After him. I'm going to finish. I'm going to die before him. He's going to kill me. If I stay after him. He's putting a, a condition here. And then he continues. And he says. فَمَنْ حَلَّ عُقْدَةً أَمَرَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِشَدِّهَا وَفَصَمَ عُرْوَةً أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ إِيثَاقَهَا فَقَدْ أَبَاحَ حَرِيمَهُ وَأَحَلَّ حُرَمَهُ If a person cuts the ropes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established and goes against the commands of Allah, then he has committed a grave sin. In other words, he's saying that this Ma'mun al-Abbasi is going to kill us. Those Bani al-Abbas have killed us. And he's going to negate whatever he is promising to do. And then he refers to the first negation. Then listen to what he says. Interestingly, he says, إِذْ كَانَ بِذَٰلِكَ زَارِيًا عَلَى الْإِمَامِ مُنْتَهِكًا حُرْمَةَ الْإِسْلَامِ بِذَٰلِكَ جَرَ السَّالِفْ فَصَبَرَ مِنْهُ عَلَى الْفَلَتَاتِ He said, that is what happened to my predecessor, referring to Amir al-Mu'mineen, سلام الله عليه والله أعلم. Apparently, he is referring to Amir al-Mu'mineen here. People gave their bay'ah, their allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Historians narrate Hadith al-Ghadir. They narrate it. They said it happens. People gave their allegiance. The man came and he said, Congratulations, Ya Ali. You have become my master and the master of all the believers. He himself said it. But two months later, everything else gets changed and people negate their allegiance. So he's saying 
This happened before. And then this man, referring to Amir al he was patient. Patient on that incident. Ala al-falatat. Referring to the hadith of the second man. Bay'atu fulan falta waqallahu al-mu'minina aw al-muslimina sharraha. The second man said the allegiance or the bay'ah of that first man, it was a very rushed event. Very rushed. Without thought. We did not, no thought was put into it. May Allah safeguard the Muslims from its consequences. He himself is saying. And Imam is referring to that. He's saying that's what happened. Before me, so it's not new. This is not new. People give their allegiance and then they change back against us and then they come and kill us. Nothing new. Until he goes then and he says, he comes to the part where he says, and I have made a vow and a covenant between me and my Lord. Again, if I do actually become the leader of the Muslims, so how will he rule? How will he lead? This is interesting. إن استرعاني أمر المسلمين وقلدني خلافته العمل فيهم عام وفي بني العباس بن عبد المطلب خاص بطاعته وطاعة رسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. If Allah makes me become the Khalifa, if if I do become the Khalifa, I will deal with all Muslims in general and even with بني العباس. He even says. Even with Bani al-Abbas, I will deal with all of them بِطَاعَتِهِ وَطَاعَتِ رَسُولِهِ With the obedience of Allah and the obedience of Rasulullah. It means I'll follow the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. That's how I'm... It means I'm not going to go and graze the banner of revenge. And he says, mentions Bani al-Abbas. Again, indicating what crimes they have committed against them. But he says, if we come to power... We don't do these things. We don't go and do mass killing. We forgive and we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, وَأَن لَا أَسْفِكَ دَمًا حَرَامًا وَلَا أَبِيحَ فَرَجًا وَلَا مَالًا I will not kill anyone unjustly. Nor will I, God forbid, attack any Muslim, any woman, or take any money that is not rightful for us. Again, indicating what? Indicating the current system, the current khulafa. They are doing all these things. This is not our style. This is not the tradition of Rasulullah and the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when it comes to placing people in positions, not because he is my family member and he is my relative. No, because they are good. وَأَنْ أَتَخَيَّرَ الْكُفَاتَ جَهْدِي وَطَاقَتِي وَجَعَلْتُ لِذَلِكَ أَوْ بِذَلِكَ عَلَى نَفْسِي عَهْدًا مُؤَكَّدًا يَسْأَلُنِ اللَّهُ عَانَ He says, I will choose those who have the ability. Not because he's my friend, he's my relative. No. Whomever is worthy of being in that position. That is the plan. This is my message. And then he continues on and he says, however, he says, والجاف, later on he says in his speech or in his document, يدلاني على ضد ذلك. الجامعة والجاف, it is said this was a dictation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam to Amir al about everything that will happen until the day of judgment. Ahlul Bayt have that knowledge. Now a person will say, how can they have that knowledge? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Jinn that he has the knowledge of the unseen. Allah has the knowledge of the unseen. Alim al-ghayb. Allah is alim al-ghayb. And all the followers of Ahl al-Bayt agree on that. There is no doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alim al-ghayb. Nobody disputes that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Jinn says he does not reveal the ghayb to anybody except whom he chooses or is pleased with. In other words, it means what? It means there are certain individuals whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the permission to know the unseen. Al-Khidr, 
alayhi salam when he killed the boy who had not yet committed the ma'asiyah. How did he know that? When he broke that ship, how did he know that? Isn't that the knowledge of the unseen? Alim al he became Alim al -ghayb. He knew the ghayb. Musa didn't know the ghayb. That's why Musa was protesting. But Khidr knew the ghayb. He did not know it independently. Allah gave it to him. Allah gave it to him. So there is nothing wrong. Allah is capable of giving that knowledge to whomever he wills. And so Allah is giving this knowledge to Ahlul Bayt alayhim was salam. And Amir al Mumin refers to that in Nahjul Balagha, where he says, This is not when a man asked him, he said, Yeah, Amir al do you know Ta'lamul Ghaib? Because Amir al Mumin started speaking about what will happen in the future. How there will be Hajjaj coming to power, how much bloodshed will be caused, and then the attack of the Mughals and so on and so forth. He, he spoke of all that. A man stood up in Nahjul Balagha and said, Ya Amir al Mumin, Ta'lamul Ghaib? You know the Ghaib? He smiled and he said, no, but this is a knowledge taught to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet taught us this. And this was dictated in books or in documents known as Al-Jafr wal Jami'ah. This is only with Ahl al-Bayt. Today it is with our master, Ajallallah ta'ala farajahu sharif He has it. So Imam is referring to it. He says, in that Jafr and in that al Jami'ah, they state that I will not get to power. I will not become the Khalifa. And then he concludes, he talks more, he says many more things, and then finally he says, وَمَا أَدْرِي مَا يُفْعَلُ بِي وَلَا بِكُمْ إِنِ الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ You know, just so that he can speak to the mentality of the people, he tells them, and I don't know what will happen to me and to you, but al-hukum is in the hands of Allah. Ultimately, Allah has the power. This is so that people, you know, start to not think of the Imam as, God forbid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, he tells them, you know what? And ultimately, the ultimate knowledge is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ultimately, this is what we have. We have this knowledge. But ultimately, the power and the plan is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he told al Ma'moon that I will not assign any minister, nor I will take any minister out of his position. I don't deal with any of the politics of the system, of the state. Nothing. And Ma'moon accepted that. Now what happened as a consequence with this? So Ma'moon accepted everything on this agreement. Immediately afterwards, at a time when people could not even tell their children that we are Sayyids, people started coming into the house or the mansion of al Ma'moon al-Abbasi, inside the Khalifa's mansion, paying their allegiance to Imam al-Rada salam Allahi alayhi and reciting verses of poetry praising Imam al-Rada alayhi salam and declaring his imam. This was something that's not easy, huh? We might think it's something, you know, what's the point of it? No, something very significant. People could not even tell their children that you're Sayyid. They were afraid. All of a sudden now, in the house of the Khalifa, people are paying their allegiance. This happened according to Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, May Allah bless his soul in Mafatih al Jinan. He says this happened on the sixth day of the holy month of Ramadan. The bay'ah was given to the Imam on the sixth day of the holy month of Ramadan in the year 201 after Hijrah. 201 after Hijrah. He says, and that day is a day of, of celebration for the Shia. They celebrate it. And hence he says there are two rak'ah salat of shukr, gratitude to Allah. People should pray on that day, the sixth day of Ramadan. In each rak'ah once, alhamd, and 25 times, qul huwa Allahu ahad. Out of the gratitude to Allah for bringing haq, at least even though in the surface, but people gave their allegiance. The coins, then Ma'moon made coins with Imam's name, alayhi salam, written on these coins. And people started dealing with these coins. And this, this is again a big thing. After being persecuted by Bani Abbas and Bani Umayyah after being cursed on the members of Bani Umayyah for 60 years. Now the rightful leaders are recognized. So this brought indeed glory to Ahlul Bayt and brought relief to the Shia of Ahlul Bayt and to the family of Ahlul Bayt. It saved blood. It saved lives. It brought dignity back to Islam. People started recognizing what is a true Khalifa or who is a true Khalifa? What should he be like? 
This is the true Khalifa. This is the true Khalifa. Because for the first time in many years, the true Ma'soom embodied a body. People can relate to a true Khalifa, a true Ma'soom, a true leader. They can see a figure. That was embodied in Imam al-Rida sallallahu alayhi So this move by Imam al-Rida alayhi salam indeed had so many advantages. Brought so many blessings to Islam that many people are aware, unaware of. That's why people, a man came to Imam al complaining, Ibn Rasulullah, why did you do this? Why? He, asked, he told him, he said, who is better? A leader who is kafir or Muslim? He said, well, a Muslim leader. He said, Yusuf alayhi salam accepted to be the minister of the pharaoh of his time, who was kafir. I accepted to be the, the successor of, or the minister of, at least a Muslim. By name, at least he's a Muslim. But you people don't know. You don't see this. So brothers and sisters, this move of Imam al-Rada alayhi salam indeed was such a great blessing. And this poet, this poem I recited at the beginning, was one of the verses of poetry which one of the poets recited to Imam al-Rada in public. In public. Nobody could have said this in public. In fact, Ma'mun was calling upon the poets, telling them, recite verses of poetry, praising Ali ibn Musa al-Rida. Subhanallah. That's why it was a day of joy, time of happiness. And one, one of them, he didn't show up. So Ma'mun told him, why didn't you show up? Then he recited a few verses of poetry. He said, you claim, Ma'mun, that I am the most eloquent of all poets. This is Abu Nawas. Abu Nawas. You claim that I am the most eloquent of all poets. In verses of poetry. قيل لي أنت أوحد الناس طرا في فنون الكلام البديع أو في فنون الكلام النبيه until he said فعلاما تركت مدح ابن موسى والخصال التي تجتمعنا فيه قلت لا أهتدي لمدح إمام كان جبريل خادما لأبيه he said you tell me why didn't you praise علي بن موسى الرضا I was thinking to myself, how can I praise an Imam? Because Abu Nawas was Shia. How can I praise an Imam who Jibra'il was serving his father? How can I praise him? What can I say about him? You know, so this was now in the court of Al Ma'mun al Abbasi, in the court of the Khalifa. So when this popularity grew of Imam al, of Imam al Rada, then Ma'mun uh, decided to kill Imam alayhi salam. And indeed, it shows how great this move was because even Ma'mun himself says, he himself says later on, he was told, what did you do here? Why did you, how did you appoint Ali ibn Musa al-Rada? He said, he said, أَمَا وَقَدْ عَمِلْنَا مَا عَمِلْنَا وَأَخْطَأْنَا مَا أَخْطَأْنَا وَأَشْرَفْنَا عَلَى الْهَلَاكِ مَا أَشْرَفْنَا He said, we did whatever we did now. Whatever has been done is done. خلص. And we made a big mistake. The mistake now is done and we are about to perish because of that mistake. We're about to perish. The whole kingdom is about to perish. He says, however, we have to solve this issue slowly, slowly. And indeed, he kills Imam al-Rida. Imam al-Rida narrates this hadith, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat. He says, he himself says this hadith. He said, قَالَ جَدِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ A part of me he said, my grandfather Rasulullah said, a part of me will be buried in Khurasan. Whomever goes to visit him, عارفاً بحقه, recognizing who he is, recognizing his right, then Jannah becomes mandatory for him. So we pray to Allah to make us among the Shia of this Imam. And this also tells us when we go to visit this Imam, brothers and sisters, we have to stand before him, read his ziyara, but recognize who this Imam is. It means when I stand there and say, Assalamu alayka ya Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, I have to say this with wholeheartedly. Every cell in my body has to say this. And then I have to ask myself as I'm saying this, am I a true servant of this man? Am I a true follower of this man? My akhlaq, is it the akhlaq of what Ahlul Bayt like to see? 
my temper, is it whatever Ahlul Bayt like? My akhlaq, my manners, my hijab, is it what this Imam likes? The way I look, the way I behave, the way I deal with another one, do I really recognize who this Imam is or not? That's a question we have to ask ourselves when we go for the ziyara of this man. How do I deal with my brother? How do I deal with my sister? How do I deal with my siblings? How do I deal with my parents and my children and my family? What about the society? All this is questions we have to ask ourselves to see if we are truly followers of this man. Imam Musa, salam, Ali ibn Musa, rida, salam, Allah, alayhi. And he was buried in Khurasan, where now millions of people go to do the ziyara and pray to Allah. Mu'mineen and mu'minat pray to Allah wholeheartedly because Ahlul Bayt are great. And tonight, believe me, if a mu'min prays wholeheartedly with yaqeen, with certainty, your dua will be accepted, inshallah, because Ahlul Bayt are so generous. They're generous. And when we are here being their guests, the guest of Imam al rida who was nicknamed as a Sultan, the Sultan will not let you leave without your haja unfulfilled or with your haja unfulfilled. So raise your hands for the dua, especially praying to Allah to make us among the Shia of this Imam, to make us among those who Allah bless us to do his ziyara in dunya and to reach his shafa'a in akhira, insha'Allah. Many mu'mineen have requested dua. Many of us have hajat before Allah. Raise your hands for Allah. Let us pray together. Many of them are also ill, have requested also dua for shifa and recoveries. Many are facing difficulties and lack of security. For all those mu'mineen, for everybody, we raise our hands and we say, Ya Allah bi Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, iqdi hawa'ij al-muhtajeen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَا ويكشف السوء أما أن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما أن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا يا الله كفر عنا سيئاتنا يا الله وتوفنا مع الأبرار مع محمد وآله الأطهار يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا أبا الحسن يا علي يا ابن موسى أيها الرضا يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا وجيها عند اشفع لنا 
إلهنا بمو بعلي بن موسى الرضا غريب الغرب أقضي حوائجنا جميعا يا الله أقضي حوائج المحتاجين يا الله إلهي بعلي بن موسى اجعلنا من شيعة محمد وآل محمد يا الله وارزقنا في الدنيا زيارتهم وفي الآخرة شفاعتهم يا الله إلهنا بعلي بن موسى آمن المؤمنين في أوطانهم يا الله إلهنا بعلي بن موسى شافي وعافي جميع المرضى يا الله اللهم وكل من أوصونا بالدعاء أقضي حوائجهم شافي مرضاهم يسر أمورهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين إلهنا بعلي بن موسى عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحا وقائدا ونا هو دليلا وعين حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم بعلي بن موسى أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه إلى أنا بعلي بن موسى أرزقنا حج بيتك الحرام في عامنا هذا وفي كل عام واغفر لنا تلك الذنوب العظام ولا تخلنا من زيارة قبر نبيك والأئمة عليهم السلام إلهنا مولانا نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج سيدنا مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح مات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات